Running a project means doing your part to manage the budget for that project. Decisions you will make are going to affect the financial outcome of the project. In order to do your part to help manage these budgets, you need to know what the budgets are. Some companies may not be accustomed to giving this information up, but if you ask for it, most will be impressed enough that you are interested to give it to you with little resistance. Let them know that in order to manage your project budgets properly, you need to know and understand those budgets. Most of this information will likely come from your project manager. Once you understand the budgets and what to ask for, you can really impress your project manager by asking for the information. Most foremen just run like hell and wait for the project manager to tell them how they're doing. By understanding these budgets and by playing a role in managing them, you're taking a huge step up from the other foreman in your company. This is just one more key in boosting your wage and status in the company. I'm going to give you a broad overlook of the budgets you will need to manage here and then go into more depth later where I'll show you how to monitor and control these budgets. Let's take a look at some of the information you'll need to know, starting with labor. You'll need to know the total estimated labor hours in your project, the true total estimated labor hours. Many project managers will cheat the hours when they report them to you in order to promote more urgency in the project and to bank hours for a rainy day. That's your job, so be aware of this. Reassure your PM by letting him or her know that you are on their team and that you'll be managing these hours responsibly and that in order to do so, you need to know the honest number of estimated hours in your project. If possible, try to get these hours broken up for you by phase of construction or company cost code. Examples of this might be underground conduit, above ground conduit, wire, trim, service, or site, building one, building two, etc. If the total hours are all you can get, don't worry. I'm going to show you how to break the hours out the way you'll need them. At the very least, you need to know the total estimated hours in the project. Next, you need to know the estimated average labor rate, or ALR, for your project. When a project is estimated, the estimator needs to determine an estimated cost for one hour of labor. Generally, this is done by building a fantasy crew that might be used to build the project, adding their wages together and dividing by the number of workers. Example, Joe Gibbs, foreman, $27.15 an hour. Bob Hansen, journeyman, $22.50 an hour. George Krebs, journeyman, $19.75 an hour. Paula James, journeyman, $20.15 an hour. Jim Boss, apprentice, $17.25 an hour. Chris Green, apprentice, $15.17 an hour. Total wages, $121.97 per hour. Divided by six workers equals $20.33 average labor rate. By multiplying the average labor rate by the total estimated labor hours in your project, you can determine the project labor budget. You need to know this because you can spend this money any way you see fit in order to complete the project on budget. Many companies manage the labor hours on their projects and ignore the labor dollars. This is a mistake. It's important to understand that hours of labor are not the same. For example, if a conduit run from point A to point B is projected by your estimate to take 10 hours and your average labor rate on the project is $20 an hour, 
that gives you an installation budget of $200. A $20 per hour electrician will have 10 hours to complete this work profitably. However, a less skilled electrician making $10 per hour could spend 19 hours installing that conduit and actually beat your budget. Conversely, an electrician earning $22 per hour could take 15 hours to install the same conduit and go over budget on the task, meaning you will need to save money on other tasks in order to complete the project on budget. If you go over budget on one task, then you have to go under budget on another task in order to complete on budget. This is why tracking hours is unreliable as far as predicting profitability, although it does give a gauge for monitoring progress. Do you see how the wage of the worker or workers affects how your labor dollars are spent? The higher paid they are, the faster they need to complete tasks in order to maintain profitability. Normally, the higher paid a worker is, the more efficient they will be at installing material. But you have to watch out. Sometimes workers get promoted because people like them, not because they're efficient at installing material. You need a way to identify these individuals and get them off your project if possible. Other workers are way more efficient at installing material than they're getting paid for. I'm not one to capitalize on a worker who will work himself to death for a wage far lower than he deserves, and I will generally try to get them a raise that will get them closer to their worth while still providing a good benefit to the company. But you need to be able to identify these profitable workers and surround yourself with as many of them as possible. Most foremen have no idea who their most profitable workers are. They only know who they like and who they don't like. This business has nothing to do with working with people you like. If you're going to be successful and rise to the top, both in wage and in recognition, you need to work with people who are profitable. And I have a little bad news for you. It's been my experience that the most profitable employees can be the most difficult to manage. They're generally exceptionally bright and high strung. This means they have time to complete their work and still engage in behavior that will drive you nuts. Remember that kid in school who could get straight A's without even opening a book? Kind of like that. You need to grow some thick skin and learn to tolerate them. They are a tool for you to use to turn a profit on your project and boost your income. The last thing you want to do is run them off your project because they hurt your feelings. That's what you get paid for after all, managing difficult employees and creating profitable projects. I'll give you a method to really determine who is profitable and who isn't with hard numbers in an upcoming lesson. I'll also show you an easy method to maximize the productivity of every worker on your crew. You'll want to pay close attention to your actual average labor rate as you build your project. In order to do this, you're going to need to know the true wage of every worker that comes on your project. Again, depending on the company that you work for, they may or may not offer this information willingly. But it is insane to try to manage a project without knowing your daily average labor rate. You'll have control over this number by the wages of the workers you select to make up your crew. While I'll not tell you that exceeding your average labor rate will definitely put you over budget, until you get a feel for the productivity of your crew, I would try to stay as close to the estimated ALR as possible. You have to understand that if the average labor rate of your crew exceeds the average labor rate that was used to estimate the project, you'll have to install material faster than projected by the estimate in order to maintain the budget. Ideally, you want to run below your estimated average labor rate 
with a crew that is producing at or above the required rate of installation. By doing this, you can actually bank labor dollars. These banked labor dollars could be converted back into labor hours and used to overcome losses if your estimator overlooked some tasks on your project or if you encounter minor rework. If your worker has 10 hours to complete a task and they only use seven, those other three hours don't just disappear. Those hours multiplied by the average labor rate create an excess labor budget that is available for other tasks. Or, if they remain unspent through the duration of the project, they become extra profit. That's a good thing. When you receive the average labor rate for the project, you need to ask whether it includes labor burden or not. Labor burden or costs, in addition to the employee's wage, that the contractor has to pay to employ them. These costs include, but are not limited to, employer paid taxes, workman's comp, health and welfare benefits, paid holidays, vacations, and other similar expenses. If you're given the average labor rate excluding labor burden, ask what the projected company labor burden is in addition to the employee's wage as a percentage. You'll need to add this to the employee's true wage in order to calculate the actual average labor rate of your crew. Labor burden can be complex depending on which state you're in and can vary by employee within a company. So if possible, ask for an unburdened average labor rate and use that to track labor. It is your responsibility to select the worker or workers with the strengths needed to complete the task on or under budget. To the best of your ability, it is also your responsibility to select and build a crew who meets these requirements. The availability of profitable workers within your organization at the time of your project will play a huge role in this, but do not overlook bringing in new talent if necessary in order to succeed. You need to use every advantage to complete on budget. If the available workforce will not provide that result, you need to speak up and ask for permission to locate new talent. Many project managers like to be responsible for the crew selection. If you're not permitted to do this initially, cry about it. Many project managers like to feed foremen the crew they want you to use. Do not let them do this. You are the person responsible for managing that crew and you are the one who needs to be responsible for crew selection. If you're not permitted to do this initially, cry about it. Be a pain in the butt and don't stop asking until you succeed. By doing so, you'll be able to get a leg up on the other foreman who accepts status quo. There are ways to track individual workers' profitability, and I'll introduce you to that in the future. By tracking each worker's profitability, you can produce hard numbers that will prove your argument if you find that you need to replace a worker who is not installing material profitably. A highly profitable employee alongside a not so profitable employee can still provide profitable results but you need to monitor that balance regularly. Don't worry, I have a simple method for you to use to do this. Equipment rentals are a great area to save money and equipment rentals are a great area to lose money. Equipment rental is an area where you need to exercise close supervision. Equipment is rented by the day, by the week, and by the month, which is a four week cycle. The way it works, in case you don't know, is that if you rent a piece of equipment for two days, you might as well rent it for a week. And if you rent it for a week and a day, you might as well rent it for a month because the costs escalate quickly after you exceed each billing level. It's very important to know where you are in your rental cycle. Always note when the equipment is delivered to the site. Pay attention to the rental cycle and get the equipment off-site before it rolls into a longer rental cycle if possible. If your estimator foresaw a one-week rental and you keep it for a week and a day, you just went over budget. 
if you have multiple pieces of the same equipment, like scissorless for example, and they came on site at different times, always check the rental cycles to determine which are closest to rolling over when it's time to send one back in order to maximize the rental on the other lifts. If you return a lift that is 10 days into a new rental cycle and keep one that's about to roll over into a new cycle, you just wasted money. Whenever you call rental equipment off that you have multiple pieces of, like scissor lifts, always ask where each piece of equipment is in its rental cycle and pick the most advantageous to be picked up. You need to plan your tasks that require rental equipment carefully. Remember that there is a pickup and drop off charge for each piece of equipment. If you can stretch the tasks out so that you can do more with each piece of equipment, thereby limiting the pieces of equipment rented, you can minimize the number of pickup and delivery charges. Negotiate with rental vendors to see if they will pick up multiple pieces of equipment at the same time to minimize these charges. If you negotiate at the beginning of the project, they're more likely to work with you in order to secure your business for the duration of the project. Try to coordinate work to hit maximum rental cycles as much as possible. If you use a piece of equipment for two weeks, you're going to pay a one month rental on it. By monitoring multiple rentals and cycling properly, you should be able to maximize rental cycles. Always get a confirmation number when you call off equipment and note the call off date. It is common for rental invoices to be askew when they arrive. Always ask your company to forward rental equipment invoices to you for approval before being paid. If the rental company overbills for a piece of equipment and you don't see the invoice, you're going to lose the savings you created by managing that equipment diligently. Most project managers solicit quotes for the material on your project. This will probably include lighting, switchgear, wire, and the bulk of conduit boxes, fittings, and supports, for example. So it's likely that big ticket items will already be taken care of for you and you'll only be responsible for site-specific materials that were not foreseen in the estimate. One of the biggest issues with projects are daily material runs to the wholesale house for incidental material. Not only are these trips wasteful in terms of labor that's not being utilized to install material while the electrician is off-site, it may also be expensive in terms of material that is not competitively quoted. Talk to your PM and see if they have made arrangements at any suppliers to ensure good pricing on incidental materials and make sure you use the selected suppliers. If necessary, negotiate your own pricing with one of your suppliers in order to guarantee responsible pricing. If you will assure them that you will come to them first when seeking incidental materials, they will usually agree to provide good pricing. On large ticket items, it may be necessary to solicit several quotes in order to make the best selection. In the future, we'll discuss methods to avoid last minute purchases, which is the best option. Ordering material at the last minute often requires overnight or other costly shipping. Shipping charges can cut deep into your material budget and sink your boat. Material orders need to be planned properly in order to avoid shipping charges if possible. Subcontractors are another area of your budget that you need to pay close attention to. Generally, if there are deficiencies in the project documents and a change order becomes necessary, you'll benefit from those additional charges by marking up your subcontractor's charges by the allowed percentages. However, there can be possible back charges that you'll not be compensated for. For example, if you delay your subcontractor's work and they need to demobilize and then remobilize, they will likely charge you for that. It is your responsibility to make sure that the project is ready for the subcontractor when they arrive on site. 
You need to pave the way for them and make their work as simple and efficient as possible. I'm not saying that you need to squander your budget to accomplish this, but I am saying that you play a huge role in their profitability. If you don't manage your project well, you can destroy their budget. If they don't make money on your projects, they will either quit working for your company or start charging more on your projects to offset your inability to manage them properly. Either option could dull your company's competitive edge and give you a bad name. You need to view a copy of the subcontract and understand it well so that you do not ask them to perform work outside their contract agreement. Doing so could create additional charges or inadvertently approve means and methods that will create additional work and expenses on your part. Knowing and understanding your subcontract agreements will also prevent you from doing work that may actually be part of their contract. Know your subcontracts. Make sure your subcontractors perform their entire scope of work and hold your subcontractors to their budget. If you create savings in material costs, equipment rental costs, and subcontractor costs, and go over budget on labor, it is still possible that you could end the project on budget. This is important to understand because many companies don't track their budgets closely enough to know where they're making money and where they're losing money. Many simply know that if they factor their labor, material, and other costs a certain way, they make money. What I'm saying is that depending on how sophisticated your company is, or unsophisticated, it is possible that they're shorting your labor budget and compensating it by inflating other budgets like material costs, simply because they don't know how to adjust them properly. It is also possible that even though they are out of whack on their labor, and even though the project met its budget overall, they may still tell you that the project went over budget simply because your labor went over on hours. It is your job and your responsibility to know where their estimate was lacking and where it was fat in order to show them how to make the necessary adjustments to make accurate estimate predictions. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of their jacked up estimating system. Do not let them fail you like that or you run the risk of gaining the reputation of being a losing foreman when in reality you are a foreman working for a losing company. Hold them accountable. I'll show you how. If you're working out of town, per diem and hotel costs might be another budget you need to control. Find out what the budget is and monitor it. Some ways to control it are to hire as much local workers as possible, stack guys too deep in a hotel room, or rent an apartment and put three or four in there. Apartments are much cheaper than hotels. In some cities, you can find corporate furnished apartments. You also need to negotiate pricing with hotels. If you're going to be renting several rooms for several months, that is some bargaining power. Not all hotels will negotiate, but if you're persistent, most will. There may be additional budgets within your scope of work that I've not discussed here. Make sure you get with your project manager and identify all the budget items that you'll have influence over and then manage them closely. I'll talk more about this when we address our field management system where I will provide you with the system for managing all budgets effectively. From here we'll start digging deeper into proper labor management.